Okay, so my name is Valentina Kutsokrea. Welcome everybody to this um, to this seminar. As I was already mentioning, I'm going to, to chair this seminar today, but this is an initiative of a wider project, which is a print project uh, called Mapping uh, Youth Futures. Uh, I'm not going into the discussion and the description of what the project entails, but there is a part of the project that is specifically on young people looking at the future, in particular through mobility. So this seminar is um, um, is devoted uh, to, to this subtopic of the project. Uh, the idea was for this the third appointment, there will be a fourth one in July, uh, to invite uh, a speaker uh, who has recently written on uh, young Italians who have migrated or uh, have been mobile to the UK, Michela Franceschini from uh, UCL, Institute of Education. She is going to uh, pick up these distinctions among the others, what is different between a mobility and uh, um, a migration in relation to the lives of uh, young Italians, and specifically in London and the UK. And this, I think, is one of the most interesting parts of our work on this. Michelle is not only specialized in mobility and migration, she looks, she has looked more broadly in this uh, in this year at issues of multiculturalism and uh, in particular um, uh, Muslim Italian, uh, sorry, uh, migrants and uh, Muslim in the UK. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, is that okay? Mm -hmm. is that right? And uh, um, she uh, has um, dealt with uh, uh, political identities and civic uh, values of British young people, so she also looks at uh, British young people. And uh, one of the most recent things that uh, she's done that, that have been, uh, has been quite interesting is a focus on the island of Lampedusa and the recent migration to Lampedusa. Uh, also using some interesting uh, visual methods. So the talk that she is going to um, uh, discuss today with us is drawn from a recent, a recent article um, which has appeared in the Journal of Ethnic, Ethnic and Migration Studies and is concentrated on young Italians in the UK. Um, she is going to talk uh, about the culture of migration that is behind this kind of mobility or migration and the kind of vulnerability that grows, uh, that, that is uh, attached to this specific, uh, this specific group. Uh, Michaela is going to um, is going to, to speak for about 35-40 minutes and then I'm going to anticipate now that and then the floor will be given to two discussants uh, which we have also invited. One, one of them, Elena uh, Camotti from the University of Milan Bicocca, is also part of the, the project Mapping Youth, uh, youth Futures. And she's also uh, looking at, uh, is uh, um, uh, encountering Michaela as well, uh, although uh, she's also uh, involved in uh, a series of other projects um, in, in multiculturalism and cosmopolitanism as well. And then I'm going to give the floor for other 10 minutes to Luca Raffini, uh, who works at the University of Genoa. Uh, Luca Raffini has uh, um, expertise in uh, political participation, young people as well, social innovation, mobility and migration, and recently she's he has written a book uh, on uh, mobilità e migrazione, that's the title with Alberta Giorgi. Uh, so his research interests are also converging into the direction uh, that we are, we are going to discuss today. So I don't want to, to take uh, more time. I just want to say that uh, the seminar will be recorded. Our intention is to put the recording on the website of the project. So if anyone wants to intervene and doesn't want to show himself or herself, uh, maybe just don't, don't switch on uh, the camera at that point. And for the rest, the, the technical request is just to, to switch off the, the microphone when you're not talking just to ensure the, the, the better um, possible level of uh, uh, audio for everyone. So, um, 
So it's my pleasure now to give uh, um, uh, Michela Franceschelli the floor and start with her presentation. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Valentina. I'm going to start with uh, sharing the screen. Well, I want to start by thanking you, uh, Juliana and Valentina, for inviting me. And um, I actually look forward to knowing more about the development of your projects, Mapping Youth Future. And I also uh, want to start with thanking and acknowledge my friend and colleague, uh, is Professor Mauro Giardiello from Università Roma 3. Um, we collaborated in this particular project. Uh, he helped with research design and data collection, and also thanks to his university for funding uh, this pilot together with UCL. I also want to add on what um, Valentina was saying. This research project is quite different from the usual stuff that uh, I'm, I'm doing before. First of all, it's trying to bring together uh, what are my main research interests, some lies more in the area of migration studies and some are uh, rather uh, closer to the area of youth studies. So this is slide in between the two, which made it slightly complicated in terms of the literature. Anyway, there are other overlap, other differences with previous work. Normally I tend to work and um, research community that are quite different from myself and therefore a research as an outsider but in this one although i'm not fully an insider i can say that i'm much closer to the research participant than i would have normally be in any other research project before and that as i will tell you briefly uh, later on um poses some challenges it didn't necessarily make it easier so um I realized quite annoyingly that I'm not going to tell you about the aims and the research question until more than halfway through the presentation. So I correct this uh, about the talk and I want to start by telling you now, before I go on with the long introduction, what I'm going to talk about. And this Facebook post by um, a research participant um, sort of help me to go through um, what I'm trying to say in here. Um, this is from Matteo, a young adult in his mid, in his mid 30 that is criticizing the post-Brexit British point-based migration regime, uh, which came into be, um, I think, sometime in 2020. Um, he's writing, if this stupid new UK migration system were in place eight years ago, I would have never had the chance to move to London. My English was rubbish and the hospitality industry, I'm jumping a little bit, was my only option. Um, it was this set of work that made me meet with like-minded people and ultimately allow me to learn English and uh, move on into a line of work which I was more interested in. So, uh, related to this, this paper tries to catch some of the inequality that characterize the migration journeys of Italians who have moved to the UK, the focus here is going to be London, uh, after the 2008 recession. I try to do this by looking at the tension between how migration journeys are initially imagined and recounted, recounted by the research participant and how then they speak about their experience after they migrated. In doing so, I'd like to contribute quite ambitiously <laughs> to discussion about the nature of contemporary life course transition and particularly how these migrants negotiate the search for novelty and adventure and new life experience, but also with the need for stable social relationship and financial security. Okay, to do all of this, I um, will start briefly, I would say, with some context and data. I'm really going to try to keep this short, move on to some question and debates from the literature, and then it's about the research project. And so um, I'm going to present some of the evidence through a pen portrait slash some case studies of participants. So, um, 
let's start from some background data. Um, I'm just not taking for granted that you're all familiar with EU migration. Um, British data from the Office of National Statistics suggests that currently there are about, this is data from 2019, 3.7 million EU national living in the UK, and there are over 300,000 that are Italians among those, 311,000. Polish and Romanians are historically, uh, since they've been allowed to uh, move freely within the EU, uh, the two largest groups. And between the EU 15, uh, the top places are between Ireland, Germany, and Italy. And within the last five or six years, these three, possibly Ireland has always had more, but between Germany and Italy, they've been swapped place amongst each other. I also had a further note about um, EU migrants based on British, on British data. Um, and this is about what sort of sector they tend to be employed in. Um, generally, this is uh, relevant because there is a lot of debate, I will tell you a little bit later about brain drain, about yeah, where uh, EU migrants uh, find employment once they move to the UK. It was also relevant for Brexit, or to be discussed the, uh, later. In a nutshell, these data are telling us that a lot of them uh, end up in uh, retail, the health sector, but uh, relevant for Italian, the hospitality and food services. A lot of the participants in the research were actually working on this area, on this sector. But Moving on from Europeans to more strictly Italians, I also had to move uh, to use a different data. And this is um, our, from uh, a report by an organization, I think it's based in Rome called Migrant Migrantes, which um, publish every year a report about the changing condition experience of Italian who live abroad, um, Italian migrants. Uh, this report is based not only but mostly on uh, data from IRA, which is um, not taken for granted that you know, but is a sort of um, is a sort of registry of Italians that live abroad. They are meant to register with this uh, uh, body and then it counts and provides some statistics about what's happening with them. So briefly, the migrantist report uh, is telling us that there are about 5.5 million Italian migrants currently. This is data from 2020. And interestingly, in the last 15 years, but not surprisingly, um, Italian mobility has increased, the report states, by 76.6%. I will also try to sort of present a profile. Who are these Italians that are migrating and going to live abroad? Um, okay, the report say that out of these 5.5 million, um, women are catching up with the men. It used to be more men migrating than women, but now um, the proportion is getting closer. Uh, with no surprise, generally the majority of Italians who migrate tend to be the same for other uh, groups, tend to be of working age, and possibly again with no much surprise, um, quite well established partners is that a lot of them come from uh, southern regions. What I found um, a little bit more interesting is um, the fact that even though the majority comes when they count it from southern regions, uh, Lombardia is actually the region which registered the highest number of departures uh, in the last four or five years, uh, for quite a few years actually. And this is followed by Veneto, Sicilia and Lazio. Interestingly, the report say that Sardinia and Sicilia uh, the number of uh, departure from these two regions are actually going down. And the migrants report explained that this is our cases of saturation, meaning that so many people have already left and so that any further increase has become difficult. Well, this is uh, what they say. There might be other explanation, but just uh, found it interesting that they made this point. Um, 
another, uh, another concert phenomenon that is often quoted in the context of Italian, not only also EU migrants, is this idea of a brain drain. And indeed, the level of education, the class background of EU migrants is object of investigation from quite a number of scholars. But I would argue that uh, in the early 2000s, this was very much a popular idea. But since then, um, uh, it's been challenged by um, several social science research studies, for instance, uh, amongst other, the work of Tim Tore. The idea is now that focusing on brain drain um, also provide a misleading, misleading picture of Italian and also more generally EU migration, risking of silencing or marginalizing the experience of, for instance, working class Italian or working class EU migrants. And the work of Antonucci and Barriale, which I will quote at several points in this presentation, focus on this inequality. Also, to challenge the brain drain um, narrative, uh, the migrants report, which doesn't provide um, the most reliable figure, but nonetheless quite good proxies, I would say, say that 42% of those who left Italy in 2018 had uh, a low level of qualification or no qualification, and 26% as a secondary school diploma, while only 29% had a degree. Okay, um, getting to the end with this bit, um, why the UK? It was one of the questions. Well, the UK is historically one of the favorite destinations within of Italians moving in within the European countries. No longer the top one. Brexit uh, didn't make it more appealing, of course. Um, Germany and France are uh, possibly now the, 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 the most favorite destination. Nonetheless, in the last 15 years, Italian migrants to the UK have increased by 242%. So um, it's quite a lot going on in the last 15 years. So I already mentioned in a couple of instances, um, whatever the EU migration in the UK was up to 2016, it dramatically, drastically uh, changed since the uh, British public, British citizens voted in favour of the UK leaving uh, the European Union in the summer 2016. I wanted to show you the video of Theresa May at uh, the uh, Conservative Party conference, um, but maybe I just talked through it. Um, in this particular occasion, Theresa May uh, made a statement that very much put into question uh, the cosmopolitan European identities, putting European citizenship under scrutiny, call, calling them citizens of nowhere. I have a note here. She said, today, too many people in position of power behave as though they are more in common with international elite than with the people down the road. The people they employ, the people they pass on the street. But if you believe you are a citizen of the world, you are a citizen of nowhere. You don't understand what citizenship means. And that you can create, you can imagine, created a lot of um, talking in social media in the UK and also in more established media uh, discussing the place the EU citizens were going to play into UK society after Brexit. So Brexit creates a um, feeling of othering and unsettling amongst specific groups of um, EU migrants in the UK. Some groups already experienced it more, but uh, others were new to these feelings. Um, there was a sense of growing uncertainty and insecurity. But importantly, Brexit also highlighted the need to conceptualize EU migration as highly unequal. And this is happening on multiple ground. I'm quoting here Antonice Barriale again, um, not just different and unequal by nationality and class, but also by race, involving, they argue, multiple hierarchies of whiteness. So 
Inequality uh, and looking at EU migration as unequal also means understanding how different EU migrants groups occupying different social positions within British society and how Brexit has affected them differently. Okay. Um, in order to present the research study and go through my findings, I also present um, a number of uh, sort of theoretical debates and idea. Okay, I'll start, sorry, I'll start with um, European spatial mobility. Since 1992, with the freedom of movement, many young Europeans took up the opportunity of going to study and work abroad somewhere in Europe. Um, it wasn't just the freedom of movement that pushed them or encouraged them to go, but it was also uh, international European programs such as Erasmus, Socrates, Erasmus Plus, but also national social policy and education policy. So during the 90s, some scholars argue that uh, Europe became a new laboratory of internal mobility. And I felt that um, this social, social economic and institutional context uh, that uh, of Europe in the 90s and early 2000s uh, is very much captured, depicted by a specific image of what European young free mover will look like. And the work of FAVEL, Eurostars and Eurocities, which actually was published at the outset of the 2008 reception, so it doesn't ca ca capture the complexity that came after that. But uh, this work by FAVEL, uh, I think uh, very much um, summarize this sort of mobility spirit that encourage many people to take up this adventurous and risk behavior and, and risk taking journey across Europe. Um, this is a quote from the very beginning of the book. You finish your undergraduate study and decide to leave home. You throw all your things in a rucksack and then jumping a bit, you find a job um, a couple of days later making BLT sandwiches and then you leave uh, you um, you live with uh, three other young Europeans. There are party most night, and you meet new friends every day. You feel liberated, a free mover, a denationalized European. These uh, debates and uh, um, and ideas uh, about EU intra mobility and young people borrows, I would say, quite heavily from uh, a more general theory and debates related to the mobility paradigm. In 2006, Scheller and Harry presented an outline of what they define as the new mobility paradigm, um, which they regarded as a conceptual shift in social science research and a new epistemological framework um, about how to study and understand um, human lives, pretty much. And mobility was now perceived as a sort of universalized condition of human life. The paradigm also aims to um, shift away from a negative connotation of mobility as unsettling and problematic and promote a more positive way of looking at it. These ideas fed into uh, another uh, sphere of the literature of sociological theorizing, which is the one about um, transition to adulthood. It was Robertson, Harry, and Balthasar in 2018 who wrote about mobility as a new and important marker of adulthood, some sort of rite of passages where young people have to go through in order to reach adulthood. Um, and then um, there was also another, there is also another advantages of this idea of mobility that scholar that um, write about have uh, emphasized, which is its flexibility. Differently from migration, which tend to refer to long-term settlement, 
mobility is about also, not only, but also um, different lifestyles such as temporary sojourn, uh, leisure activity, cultural and educational exchanges, volunteering abroad, educational work experience, and so on. So, um, within this theoretical framework, uh, across these different sphere and areas of sociological analysis, the language of mobility start to become distinct from the one of migration. Um, another characteristic of the mobility literature is that um, they really um, get to uh, promote uh, ideas of agency and possibility and subjectivity. I mean, as a sociologist, there are obviously acknowledgement that the experience of mobility continue to be stratified and that it's highlighted in the literature, for instance, uh, in the definition of mobility disjuncture on work on mobility imperative, looking at uh, Australian young people in rural area or the work of uh, uh, Valentina Kutsukrea about the rooted mobility of young people in Sardinia. Nonetheless, um, the idea about mobility uh, did not come without criticism. First of all, these adventurous and risk-taking behavior are most relevant for some young people in the explorative stage of their life course such as the late teens and the early 20s. But most of European migrants, as I showed you before, tend to be a little bit older than this. In her book, Making Class, Beverly Skaggs uh, challenged the idea that mobility is a universalized condition of contemporary society. Indeed, she said, mobility varies by class and background, by geography and by other structural circumstances. Skeks argued that the mobility paradigm neglects, um, sorry, neglects the dynamics of power and control behind people's movement, supporting postmodern but also neoliberal ideas about the thinning of the social structure. Moreover, if mobility continues to be associated with the special movement of the highly skilled who have free and easy uh, cross-border rights, it is also opposed to the negatively connotated unskilled labor migrants who instead need visa and are expected to integrate. The danger of this distinction is promoting, as Thomas Faist, a scholar from Germany, has argued, further discursive boundaries between movers and migrants with social and political implication. This binary thinking also risks reproducing transnational inequality. In sum, if mobility is framed as something that needs to be promoted, migration sounds like something that needs to be limited and to some extent prevented, with implication uh, about public and policy discourses. To make all of this academic research and literature relevant to sort of the real people, I want to show you how um, this idea sort of trickled down to the life and discourses of the people we talk about uh, in our research, our research participants, who overall, I will say, were quite uncomfortable to describe themselves as migrants. So uh, I'll tell you about the methodology later, but toward the end of the interview, we ask some question about identity. The interview were actually narratives, uh, but this is also some sort of wrapping up type of ending question. And one question uh, was whether they felt or ever described themselves as, mig as migrants. Um, generally, we felt these terms I acquired in the interview quite negative connotation. Example, Ricardo refer to the temporary dimension of his condition, which made, them, he made his experience sort of difficult to associate with the idea of migration. Other example, Rita here is speaking about how a higher level of social integration are somehow not compatible with the idea of being a migrant. 
And then John refers to sort of a lack of willingness, lack of intention, lack of a need to really migrate, but rather speaks about her experience as following the flow of her career pathway. Um, there were some participants that are acknowledged to be migrants, but even in these instances, migrant was a word with a negative connotation. Some of them, some of the participants spoke about it, how the feeling of being a migrant and so other from um, the British citizen became stronger after Brexit. But there were some going against the tide. This is an example from Matteo, who uh, was able to describe some sense of unity that brings together uh, very different migrants, categories of migrants who moved away from their country for different reasons. But nonetheless, they had a sort of core that could share, which is the idea of someone leaving uh, their country of origin. And I got there. <laughs> um, this is the aim of the research and of the paper and then also um, my research question. What I'm looking, as I introduced briefly at the beginning, is this tension between how the imaging mobility journey and the actual experience after migration are sort of broke together. And to uh, bring them together theoretically, uh, sort of rely on the help of two concepts that I very much um, developed inductively from the data, but then refer to literature to make sense of them. One is the idea of anchor life, and the other one is the idea of a culture of migration. And I want to check my timing. Okay, um, anchored life. Um, well, as I say, this idea very much emerged from narrative analysis of the interview, but I refer back to um, other concepts that were very relevant to explain what I was trying to say. And the literature I refer to, social anchoring or differentiating embedding, is very much coming from sort of a migration studies, well, not only, um, and it's got to do with migrants' experience of social integration after migration. There was another paper uh, referring to uh, the idea of grounded life, which was very relevant for what I was trying to say. The paper was looking at Polish and Spanish migrants in Scandinavian countries, I think it was Norway, um, and how they were trying to negotiate the difficulties of navigating the regulated labor markets. And that how they came together with the idea of this grounded life. So with me, Anchored Life has got to do with capturing the experience of migrants after they left their country and move and are trying to settle into the new country. It reflects participant effort to deal with the number of vulnerability that they face in their migration journey. And it shows how their search for security, for something branded and anchored, and stability were much more important to them than the sort of search for adventurous lifestyle. If I had to set uh, this idea into a sociological debate, it would possibly be the one about agency and structure, rather where I found reference to this, which was the social integration of migrants in the society of destination. Um, the other idea that helped me to go through the data, it was um, the idea of an Italian culture of migration. So if anchored life um, is mostly about life after migration in the new country, the idea of a culture of migration helped me to make sense about the decision to migrate and so the pre-migration context. So I argue that rather than individualized decision-making processes, decision to leave were part of a wider culture of migration, which is not simply a cultural trend, but is embedded in structural condition of a community. The idea that people are more likely to migrate if they come from a household, a community, a region, a country where many people have already left. 
So the culture of migration provides a shared imagination that encourages people moving. Okay, I'll get through the methods. I think I mentioned before that we follow a narrative approach and we use the support of um, visual tools to help the participants tell, telling us their story. So the interview was very much asking participants to draw or to select for some pre-draw uh, maps, um, to draw their experience, their migration journey by marking the ups and downs and the turning point. And from then uh, we move on to um, probe and prompt about uh, some specific experiences. Um, one issue that we put particular attention in our sampling was to try to reach a diversity between different social, economic and educational backgrounds. We found that um, we didn't fully succeed on getting experience of the most marginalized uh, Italian young adults in London. But even some of the people we spoke to had degree and managed to get uh, uh, access some professional jobs did not necessarily come from privileged or middle class backgrounds back in Italy. And the final thing that I want to say about the methodology is the reflexivity, which, as I mentioned before, uh, saw me for the first time having to relate with participants that, to some respect, um, were much closer to me than I have ever experienced before. And that led me to a sense of um, sharing, which could be useful, but also some challenging that um, made me sometimes um, tend to interfere with what they had to say, uh, thinking back to my own personal experience, but also because of our simi similarity in terms of nationality, background, social economic status, race, more judgmental about what they were trying to say. Of course, I tried to keep it for myself, but um, somehow it was there when I was speaking to them. Um, and this is about how I decide to present the findings for this particular paper. The idea of using pen portraits, which is nice terms to uh, mean case studies. The selection was difficult because um, I had a, a quite wide range of uh, uh, interview that I could have um, uh, brought in to describe the point that I wanted to make. But ultimately, the selection was driven by how effectively these cases portray the process of negotiating the freedom to move and for achieving secure and more anchored life. So it wasn't that these uh, cases are necessarily more representative of the findings in statistical terms, but they're just uh, relevant in telling you the key findings in respect to the research question and the aims of the project. Okay, sorry. Okay, I have four case studies. I'm checking my time. Mm -hmm. You have another 10 minutes. minutes. <laughs> okay, yes, thank you so much. Um, I think I'm, I'm on time, I think I can make it. So the first case study is about Chiara. Chiara is, um, was 26 years old when I spoke to her and she left the um, little suburban town in Lazio where she grew up about six years ago, uh, the, six years before the time of the interview and a couple of years after uh, finishing secondary school and the death of her father. Um, interesting, um, both her parents had no high qualification, they didn't have a degree, but they got jobs in a banking slash financial institution and Chiara um, replicated this experience by getting a job in the same financial institution in Italy, in, in the UK, but obviously moved to a, a different role. She also didn't have a degree, but managed to progress uh, within um, the position within this company quite quickly, quite well. So career wise, she was, uh, she said, quite proud of herself. Interestingly, the story of Chiara is embedded in the intergenerational transmission of a culture of migration, which in her case became part of her family history. 
she said, in my family, there is a woman from my grandmother generation onwards who lived in England. Cool, isn't it? She said, my mother and aunt both married an Englishman, brought him back to Rome, and then they divorced him and married an Italian after. So I don't know, maybe I wanted to follow the footstep of the woman in my family. And she laughed. Uh, one of the women in her family, though, recounted, she said, positive experience of London. Chiara's story highlights how the issues she experienced at home were brought forward into the new life. Chiara was trying to navigate her rejection, rejection of the standard life, life course, getting married, having children, which she had left behind in Italy, with the need for more emotional security in London. She felt proud of her career achievement in the city, but she struggled on a personal level. She said, my aggression has made my life much more complicated because I'm alone and therefore I have nobody to share my difficulties with. For her, life after migration was marked by the struggle to anchor her life to steady relationship while facing a battle with loneliness and depression. Like for many in our sample, the tension between the need for anchor life and the passion for exploration was difficult to resolve and had emotional implication. A very different story is the one of Domenico, who is a black Italian with a Caribbean heritage in his mid thirties. He says, no longer so unusual these days, they call us the new Italians. The story of Domenico reveals a very specific tension between his idea of an imagined mobility and the life after migration. He said, I always had in mind this idea of living. I always had this great fascination for London. The interview suggests that the culture of migration acted by a more intricate range of motivation. It's got to do with escaping the provincial life, similarly to other respondents, but others more specifically about his Italian, Black, Caribbean ethnic background. He said that while growing up, he had to get used to being told, wow, you speak very good Italian, together with difficulty associated with what he called a parochial and narrow-minded provincial life, Domenico experienced the extra challenges of dealing with racism and discrimination, which were summarized by what he recounted a specific life-changing event. My childhood, he said, was marked by this story. This lady, the mother of two child of a friend of mine and neighbors, I don't know why, um, I was just a child and walked on her flower beds and she said, don't step on my flower bed using the N word. And she's a high school teacher, meaning that she's educated. Do you know what I mean? By contrast, he described the advantages of being a black person in London, where it does not st um, it stick out as much as in Italy and can more e easily vanish amongst others. However, life in London was not free from challenges, he said. Domenico recounted the struggle of finding stable employment and accessing the difficult field of journalist as an outsider, lacking contacts and social networks while moving through a number of humble jobs in hospitality to get by. After six years, he has still not achieved his goal and while working part-time for a communication department of a company, he tried to rise a freelancer. Having his first child has put things into perspective. He's happy, his son will grow up in London, he say, but the financial concerns are pressing and he misses family support and the more affordable childcare available in Italy. Regardless of his childhood and coming of age experience, he's a bit wary, he say, to define Italy as a racist country, but, the experience, but he expressed quite uh, explicit concern about the divisive language and the anti-migration propaganda. And then I select the story of Lorenzo who's got something in common with Domenico. Lorenzo was in his late 30s and he was originally from a small town uh, of about 50,000 inhabitants. He had a large family but when his father dies the family experienced quite a lot of financial difficulties. He struggled through high school and he described quite a bit of details during the interview this time of his life, but he made it to get a, um, a degree in education study and achieve a first. He was very proud of that. Um, 
he, he left Italy straight after graduation, having had the taste of the bad working condition in his local area as a factory worker. For Lorenzo, the culture of migration became embedded into a sharp criticism of the Italian province lifestyle and value, which acted as an incentive to leave. Indeed, his account of why he left had more to do with the cultural setting of his local area than with work-related and economic reason. He said, I always had this deep desire to leave that place. It's nice, it's beautiful, it looks like a museum, but it's dead. What has always amazed me about small towns is how if you looked or act a bit different, you are immediately singled out. I never felt a fit in there. Lorenzo's reflection embodied an important theme about the Italian province, which was presented as more than a geographical district or a place, but rather a culture stretching from the north to the south of the country and even incorporating Milan or Rome. Yet, leaving the local community and embracing a cosmopolitan city lifestyle um, involved an old set of or new set of challenges, both in terms of personal identity and social relationship. Lacking a project and a plan, he moved from one job to another, all in hospitality, investing most of his salary into paying rent. Um, Lorenzo fell into a rough patch um, at some point in his life in London, particularly after the end of a relationship. And similarly to Chiara, he told me that he also experienced depression. At that point, he left and went traveling for less than a year, just about a few months, and moved back to London when he was already in his mid-30s. Decided to go back to education, alone and master in a prestigious Russell Group University. While switching, he saved in skilled skill jobs. So he was working in a coffee shop, but he also had a job as a part-time researcher at the university. At the time of the interview, he completed his master's degree and he got a job in the public sector, but he was wondering whether he would stop there. That was what he really wanted to do. While showing some of the features typical of free movers, Lorenzo battled with the pitfalls of so-called liquid life. He was wearing of what he calls biodegradable, different to pronounce, friendship, biodegradabili, and struggled to establish long lasting and reliable social relationships. His journey in London, he say, has been bumpy, but he's got no regrets, but still, future, he say, looks blurry. The last case study is about a woman called Sabina. Obviously, I changed all the name. She's a 40 year old writer from Rome who had a quite privileged bringing. She went to a foreign language school in Rome and then accessed one of them, the best university in Italy, graduate with a fest and then got a job in Rome and then back uh, and then in Brussels. And in Brussels is where she met her husband, who got offered a job in London in the city, and they moved together. Her story uh, very much resembled more closely the profile of a free mover brain drainer, but also, I will argue, unfold the importance of anchored life. She speaks of being part of an ambition generation of young adults who move in search of adventure and new life experience, challenging the stereotype of the provincial Italian migrants who lives with the local cheese, as she literally say, in the suitcase, dreaming of the pension back in Italy. Sabina, she, does, she, feel, she says she didn't feel like a migrant at all. For her, mobility, we say, is cultural and enhanced by the apprehensiveness of Italian family who overprotect their children and projecting them into, she say, an adventurous and predictable life. Against this backdrop, London is the perfect destination where the can-do attitude, she said, can lead you very far. For her, moving to London has, met, uh, has meant a huge challenge and life change. Leaving a highly paid job in Brussels, jump into a boy that's a freelance writer, but also um, becoming a mother while facing these new financial challenges. 
Yet, she say things have turned out well for her career as a writer and she was happy, content of how things were going for her. Dealing with these changes, she say, I will say, was only possible thanks to the financial and emotional stability provided by her husband who was able to support her and their daughter to the time. So the liquid life of enterprising mover rely on the availability of grounded support. This was similar to the experience of many other migrants in the study who took risk and left their country, their jobs, their girlfriends and boyfriends, and attempted later in life career changes. Although they did so not as individualized mobile individual, but thanks to the grounded support of their family and their social networks. Okay, I have a final slide, um, which is wrapping up some of this idea. So to conclude, um, with this paper, I try to bring together question of life transition, spatial mobility, highlighting the disjuncture between how the highly individualized profile of EU movers have been theorized and the actual circumstances of research participants. My analysis suggests that a culture of migration is behind the apparently individualized and at times sporadic and improvised departure of some of the participants. Decisions to leave Italy were formed both in relation to national and local challenges, yet these challenges were not always directly experienced by participants, but almost passed on by word of mouth and other narration, which were then reconfigured and adapted to make sense of personal circumstances. The culture of migration rather than mobility spirit act implicitly and took different form in participant narratives of departure. Indeed, the pen portraits depict how the actual reality of these supposed, sorry, movers, I hope you can hear me, the dog outside, become anchored and materialized into the experience of settlement that most migrants face. Things like learning a new language, adapting to a new environment, finding somewhere to live in the expenses and precarious London housing market. So looking for work and developing new social relationships. So in dealing with this challenge, migrants expose, I argue, clear vulnerability while telling us about experience loneliness, lacking a sense of belonging and feeling adrift. So ultimately, these migrants were looking for new life experience, which came together with the need for security and stability uh, with relationship that made them feel they belong. The paper, uh, therefore, go, goes uh, beyond the binary, my, the binary migration and mobility. And I hope it can contribute to an understanding of post-recession intra-European migration, which is sensitive to both the migrants' experience of opportunity, but also the structural change of moving across different countries. So I finish with the presentation. Mm -hmm. and I guess I can stop sharing the slides. Thanks a lot, Michaela. That was really rich. <clears throat> I mean, we think to a lot of things already, but I think it would be better if we give the floor to the discussion first. If anyone from the um, uh, who who is attending uh, already wants to to write something in the chat, uh, please do so. And then after um, uh, the the brief speeches of the discussants, I will try and bring together questions and comments, and we gi will give also the floor to to others if they want to intervene. So thanks a lot, Michela. I will leave my question and comments after the the discussant. Thanks. So maybe uh, I will ask now Elenia Camozzi to, to present her um, uh, reflections. Thanks. Thank you, Valentina. Thank you very much, Michaela, for this very inspiring and uh, rich presentation in which uh, you have, first of all, outlined an effective numerical scenario of a phenomenon that of mobility of young Italian men and women, which as Istat and Fondazione Migrantes show has been growing steadily for 10, 15 years now, especially towards some European destinations and not only. 
What I have personally appreciated is the uh, interdisciplinary, let's say, dialogue that you create between youth studies and migration studies, a dialogue that takes shape in the way you deal with some concepts that are traditionally anchored exclusively uh, to one field of study, migration studies in this case, and, and that you instead free from that field, see for example, citizenship, skilled and unskilled jobs, migration and mobility. From the point of view of such a dialogue, between sub-disciplines, I found very interesting your analysis of the tension between uh, imagined mobilities and uh, anchored lives uh, that you propose in the article, imagined mobilities and the materiality of migration, the search for anchored lives in post-recession Europe that forms the core of your presentation. In particular, I found interesting the um, conceptualization that you suggest of the term anchored lives. Uh, you refer to uh, Gritz Mala Katzlowska's concept of social anchoring to the mobility turn by Scheller and Ari to Robertson, Harris and Baldassar new paradigm mobile youth transitions to favel sketching proposal of Eurostars and Eurocities. Finally, you relate the concept of anchor lives to the idea of a culture of migration, I quote, able to account for the complexity of multiple motivations to live and how they become anchored to the national, local and personal conditions of the migrant. So it is precisely on this conceptualization of anchor lives that I would like to try to share some comments and formulate my questions. The first point I would like to stress is that in your interesting key of, in, of interpretation, namely the tension between imagined mobilities and anchor lives, it seems to me that the special dimension overpowers the temporal dimension. Even if you suggest a diachronic analysis of the bi biographical experience of the interviewees. Of course, you compare what they imagine of their mobility, which goes in the direction of Yedlowski's concept of memories of the future and what they are living in the present but the temporalities of their biographies seems to be somewhat clouded or hidden here by the special dimension of mobility. Instead, I do believe it would be interesting to try to dig into this tension between imagined mobilities and anchored lives in the light of a greater emphasis on temporality. Precisely the heterogeneity of contemporary migration and mobility experiences have led in recent years to what some scholars have called a temporal turn within migration studies. And this year is the beautiful book by Shanti Robertson, Temporality in Mobile Lives. Contemporary Asia, Australia migration and everyday time, where the author points out the mutual constitutive relationship between transforming migrant mobilities and transforming migrant temporalities, suggesting the effective concept of chronomobilities. Thus, it becomes crucial to consider first that different space temporal normative horizons guide the lives of migrants and mobile people. Second, that time also comes into play in the governance or the Serban Foucault in the governmentality of migrant and mobile lives. Finally, that multiple regime and logics of time 
influence migratory and mobile processes and young people on the move have to deal with the reality of migration mobility regime that can therefore interrupt, delay, stop or accelerate their everyday life, which is therefore out of their total control, just as out of their control is the possibility to plan and look to the future. And so the question is, uh, um, do you think it's possible or could be useful to rearticulate the tension between anchored lives and imagined mobilities in light of temporality as well? The second point of your presentation on which I would like to comment is related to what I have just said. In particular, it is related to the interesting concept of culture of migration, which I quote you, develops as a set of social norms which become established in a community and form a shared imagination encouraging further departure as if they were part of a normal course of events. I found this concept very useful in analyzing the new mobility of young Italians because it allows us to read it also from a historical perspective and therefore to take into consideration the weight of our country's migratory, migratory past which is obviously relevant in the memories of the new generations. This is an interesting element from the point of view of intergenerational memory. This concept, however, and the use that you make inevitably led me to reflect on the way many authors today interpret youth mobility. We know that in the last few years, many are questioning the relevance of youth mobility as a new turning point for, uh, of transition, as a new metaphor for the condition of youth, as uh, Valentina Kutsukrea suggested. Well, some authors provide a Bourdieuian reading of mobility and cosmopolitanism, which is often associated um, with mobility. According to Allsworth, mobility is conceived as embodied cultural capital that reflects norms, values, representations, aspirations. Space-related dispositions are embodied in young people's work aspirations in a similar way to social class. Habitus is also held to play a part in driving mobility projects. To this regard, Cairns suggested the concept of special reflexivity to indicate, I quote, the extent to which young people incorporate a geographical dimension into their transition to adulthood. And Scripps, Woodward and Bean in 2014 suggested the concept of seeds of cosmopolitanism to descri describe our mobility aspirations are incorporated throughout life courses. So my question is, could you specify this culture of migration in more analytical detail? Are we talking about an incorporated practice a la Bourdieu? Or do we have to give a more generational reading in the sense of Mannheim of a specific historical collocation? I have a very last quick question regarding the choice of the sample, and in particular, the age cohort you chose for the research that is 2340. It is a very large age cohort which is technically also considering the phenomenon of prolongation of youth actually contains old young people. Within such a wide age range, the risk is to have inevitably very different visions of mobility projects of one's own present, of one's own future, of having different resources also in terms of agency, very 
different cognitive, affective, economic resources. I would like to ask you to tell us more about the reasons for this choice and how this large corp has influenced the results. Many thanks once more. Thank you. Can I just, uh, um, can I just um, answer very quickly the one about the sample? Um, yeah. There was one person who was 23 and one person who was 40. Okay. And, uh, yes, and the majority when we calculate the average age was around 28. Uh, so we had most of the participants in the late 20 and the early 30, but to be the true, uh, we reported the whole range of age. But in the paper, I specified uh, that uh, there are these two outliers that we included, but nonetheless, the majority of the sample were late 20s, early 30, which match with 25 to 34, which is the average age of most EU migrants in the UK. Do you want me to answer the question now or, or later? I was, I was thinking that it might make uh, sense to answer the more conceptual questions uh, after Lucas' reflections. Okay, uh, what yeah. do you think? whatever you prefer, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot, Elenia. <clears throat> um, thanks a lot. Luca, do you want to um, join with your reflection? Yeah. Thanks. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Valentina and Giuliana, uh, for the, the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, um, Michela, for the inspiring presentation. I agree with Elenia about, uh, well, the appreciation uh, to the cross-disciplinary approach uh, and to the, well, bridging the literature or youth transition and mobility. And uh, it's something I try also to do because I think really it's very important. And for the, well, the critical approach uh, to the idea of mobility and the relation with the practice of mobility. So the imagined mobility and the anchored life. I focus on three points. The first is on choice opportunities and imperatives of mobility. The second one is on alternative present and alternative future, the relation with the future with the space. And well, the last on mobility and migration. migration. Um, well, it's choice and opportunity, or we speak about an imperative. Um, mobility is a central component in the definition of young people transition, okay, uh, path, we agree. Michela made reference to the entering in the mobility paradigm and so the necessity not to explore more deeply uh, the plurality of discourse, practice and the representation that's, that underlie the concept of mobility. My idea is that uh, mobility acts as, uh, uh, as in the term of Marcel Moss, a total social fact. That is uh, something that radically affects individual biographies uh, in every aspect of uh, social life. But uh, it may also create some unintended consequences. So this is the first reason to uh, compare the, the idea, the representation with the reality. Uh, well, the so-called choice biographies uh, are characterized by two important, uh, important dynamics. Uh, we know individualization and uh, presentification, uh, well, a concept uh, that Carmen Leccardi uh, explored uh, very well. Individuals are focused on the present and uh, push to be involved in short-term projects. The same life no, is conceived as a series of projects as uh, in the theory of, uh, of Boltanski and Capello. Well, the capacity of individual to connect to invest, to build a relation, and to be ever ready to change. In this situation, also the relation with space you know, becomes the object of a reflexive choice in the construction of the life project. So mobility represents another factor in the fluidification of life trajectories uh, and uh, interact with the process of individualization and fluidification in making the flex live uh, uh, organized by Valentina uh, in a, oh, well uh, in uh, a flexi mobile life. Well, I, I, why is it an imperative? Uh, as uh, also Michela quote uh, uh, with Perugia, 
Well, because the choice biography is institutional, you know, pro produced and promote, uh, starting from the school, will increase and emphasize and promote the values of the choice, innovation, adaptability, and educational level policy are aimed at supporting the individual in putting question himself uh, uh, to adapt, uh, to be competitive, and, well, individuals are also called to uh, experience mobility as a way to make a choice. So, in, if we follow with the kind, uh, this kind of, um, uh, of uh, interpretation, it seems to adapt to a vision of the individual as homo economicus, without roots, as uh, Kaufman wrote, uh, a decentralized and hyper-individualized model of society composed by, by disembodied individuals that are authors of their own, master of their own destiny, their such as their fairies. And also mobility uh, enter in this kind of uh, framework. Well, now, just the relation between the present, the space, and the future. Um, the idea is that, well, young people faced with the difficulty of forcing the future uh, are pushed to experience mobility to build a kind of alternative present to mobility. So mobility is another kind of investment, uh, but people do not have, have the same resource to mobilize and to protect and to survive to difficulties. So the expected positive effects of mobility are paid for the price of renunciation, the prevention, uncertainty. And that's very important. The experience of mobility does not necessarily lead to a safe landing place in terms of works. So it can act as a multiplier of precariousness and uncertainty. So uh, back to the uh, idea of uh, Valentina and Giuliana that mobility, yes, can represent a way to control the future, but I think it may also turn in a, another way to collapse in the present, depending on the capacity of agency. Another important uh, topic, a flexi-mobile worker has to deal every day with uh, a management of the present. Uh, to uh, the management of the social space, uh, uh, not just uh, uh, the relation with the user, uh, the relation to be built and maintained, uh, uh, the reconciliation of work, family, affection, it's another job, you know? every day, every weekend, I plan every time uh, something to choose. Uh, it's a kind of continuous work on uh, oneself. So the, uh, the quotation, the idea of Pavel, you know, uh, about the young people with the backpack, uh, very carefree, very <laughs> experiencing freedom, uh, I think uh, covers just uh, a, a part of the, the situation. Um, but in the last book, uh, Pavel and Enrique are quite less uh, optimistic about, uh, generally speaking, about uh, mobility in Europe for several reasons. And, uh, uh, well, it's very interesting, the, the, the quote uh, uh, right by Michela, uh, migration has made my life much more complicated because I am alone and therefore I have nobody to share my difficulties, etc. I remembered another uh, interview uh, from a work that I made with Alberto Giorgi, that is uh, this one. I want to imagine that there is a future, a possibility in the future where we both, well, the partner, work in the same place, maybe with little sacrifices. I renounce to something, to something, he does the same, but trying to stay together anyway. That is, as far as possible. I would like to have a child somewhere in the future. I am not sure of how this will happen. On this, I have really no idea. After these two years where I see us moving around, I say, maybe we we'll live here, maybe in France, but Mexico will still can be an option. So it's a lot of uncertainty of everything, no? Finally, uh, 
mobility and migration. Uh, I, uh, I want to be sure, so um, in EU, mobility and migration, well, yeah, uh, it's quite clear, this uh, mobility and migration have been strictly differentiated. The, the migration concern non-Europeans is something to be regulated and limited resource, but also a problem. Describe the mobility of the poor. Mobility concern Europeans, intra European mobility. So we, could, we speak about expats, not migrants. But I remember some years ago I studied the, the intra European mobility and the, especially the, uh, Brit, the British, Germans, Poles, Romanians uh, in Italy and in other countries. Well, in Italy and in our country, we speak about German as a German expat, but Romanian migrants. So the question is, what's about Italians abroad? Are they migrants, movers, or it does depend? So, which is the difference in reality between mobility and migration? I think that most of Italian mobile youth fall in the condition of what they call the middling transnationalism. It's a definition by Correnson and Laram. Something in the middle between the global elites and the groups that are at the risk of exclusion. They are not just arbiters, but neither, well, they live as an elite. They have character, characterization of both. I think maybe uh, another question was uh, the difference between mobile professional or migrant workers. Maybe they are migrant aspirant professional. And another thing, I, I think that they often live a kind of status in Congress condition. As they experience a mobility, developing a transnational lifestyle, as the elite, as the true Europeans, but they share with traditional migrants the sense of contingency and certainty. So something another time in the middle. The conclusion. And uh, it's uh, a question that I, the final question that I share with, uh, uh, well, with uh, everybody and uh, with our uh, relator. Do you think, uh, don't you think that maybe we are front uh, to a third form of mobility that, uh, well, Darwin Birba some years ago spoke about the effervescent mobility, something in the middle, uh, different from uh, the solid mobility and the different from the liquid mobility because well the solid mobility the traditional mobility describes the migration experience something unidirectional that prelude to becoming rooted in the destination country well the second the life mobility is plural in well continuous it's typical of the people who live beyond the borders the borders with a truly transnational lifestyle and relations. Maybe the fervescent, fervescent mobility represents a condition of, uh, well, that it's open in the future, of radical uncertainty about the present, about the future, and can uh, something that is evanescent can chain, change a turn in solid or turn in uh, liquid, or uh, remain for the life in a variation that it's the same that occur with the precarious uh, workers. They can become professional, they can uh, find a stable job, but there is the risk of uh, a continuous chain of uh, precarity. Well, for the moment nothing more. I think we have a lot already to, to address. Thanks a lot, Luca. Again, for this uh, rich um, uh, reflection, um, I'd like to ask Michaela if she wants to address these comments. <clears throat> yes, I can. I want to apologize to Luca. My internet connection went off on your second point. So maybe I try to answer some bits and then you help me to remind me what you were asking because I was offline for a bit. I don't know if you saw me disappearing or not, but I disappeared. Um, should I answer it now uh, to some of this? Uh, maybe I'll, I'll bring some of the points together with Elenia, um, the idea of temporality. I think it would add 
definitely something to the conceptual framework and the analysis. Um, temporality is relevant on two different empirical, practical senses in this research. Number one is the social economic, but mostly the historical context uh, where these ideas play out, which is the Brexit and the post recession. Because I think all this um, mobility free spirit used to be more popular in, in pre recession time, but things have changed. And even the discourses in migration study about EU mobility tend to be uh, more in migration terms, if you know what I mean. And so looking at uh, EU uh, more, particularly after Brexit, as EU migrants as migrants rather than free movers and so on. So temporality, yes, because it uh, referred to the importance when we are uh, dealing with this idea of the historical and, and um, social economic context, but also something that I really wanted to make clear, and, and I feel in the paper I didn't emphasize as much, the, the, the life course is very important in here. I'm speaking of people in their late 20s and early 30s, and, and Valentina's routine mobility was about uh, young people in their late teens, early 20s, so 18 years old, actually, now that I remember. So these are quite different groups, and they have different experience of migration slash mobility, view of the future and temporalities. So it's about the biography, the temporality as a biography, but also, and the place that they are in their life stage. And then there's also the temporality as the history when we are speaking about this idea. Um, so I wasn't having a goal um, exactly to uh, people that write about mobility. And indeed, I am in the process of writing a follow-up to this project. And with my colleague, we were examining whether we should call it mobilities or migration, because we are speaking of, about non-white migrants. Um, but we decided that we call it mobilities because they are not white, and we don't want to fall into white mobilities, non-white migration. And so we went back to, if I get funding, my next research project will be about mobility. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Um, the culture of migration question. Um, the question what about, uh, again, the historical dimension and whether I account for um, previous Italian wave um, of migration. I felt with the participant there was a lack of bringing in this historical dimension and acknowledging that Italians uh, have uh, migrated for a long time since the time that Italy was initially formed, I will say. Um, they were very much focused on their present and, um, and if anything they distinguished themselves from the past um, old-fashioned migrants. An example is one of the case study, the woman that tried to deprovincialize Italian migration, Italian mobility, by saying, well, we're not longer these people that carry their cheese in the suitcase and, and so on. So there was a way of, uh, we're quite different from these people. A sense that I felt, um, what I'm saying here is, as a social scientist, I think we have some sort of duty that what we say doesn't stay just amongst us, but it trickles down to what people think and, uh, and how the social media debates are formed and so on. And the feeling was very clear that people will associate with the idea of mobility, but they have quite a lot of reservation to uh, consider the self migrant because of all is attached now to it, especially in the Italian context. And so I'm also bringing in my experience of my research in Lampedusa, where there was no doubt that there were migrants and no one ever mentioned in the context of that literature mobility. Um, so that made me think. But I do account for mobility uh, taking in consideration stratification. So I make reference to the paper of Moret about mobility capital and the, MOBA, um, and the idea of mobility capital in Chatterjee. 
So yes, migrants are not disconnected from their social economic background. They bring in where they are coming from in terms of their family, in terms of the resources that they have back in the country of origins. So when you ask if conceptually, I was going more towards uh, Bourdieu or, or, the, or, or more, inter, more generational approaches, I would go for Bourdieu, which is naturally um, one of my uh, conceptual framework that I used in the past and that I tend to rely on to make sense of inequalities. Um, Look, I need your help here. <laughs> um, could you summarize your first point was about choices, opportunity and imperatives, mobilities, and then I lost you for a minute or so. Well, can you summarize your first and second question, please? Well, the first one was uh, more a reflection than a question. So uh, it's just to point on the relation uh, between choice, opportunity, and imperative. And uh, because you uh, quote uh, the idea of imperative, but well, other times it seems that it's more a choice. So, which is the ambiguous sometimes relation uh, between. Uh, imperative or choice that uh, I think it's something very difficult to... Uh, I think, I think uh, this is just one of the most challenging debates in sociology, choice of imperative agency and structure. We're all depending on one way or another. I am not really depending on the structure. I always that so. So I felt that, um, what I felt is that mobility literature tend to embrace um, agency a lot more than I would have normally done. Uh, but that doesn't mean that I'm right and they're wrong. And, and I do acknowledge that uh, uh, there are many studies from speaking about mobility capital or mobility imperative, rooted mobility, that uh, trying to balance things out. Um, I think Beverly Skeggs is my answer to this. I think when we, once we are trying to define things that are universal, mobility is the universal condition of human life, and then I just become a little bit reluctant on um, what is the role of inequality in shaping this universal trend. Um, and that was my point. But uh, I'm not by any point saying that uh, the structure has been completely ignored in mobility literature. It hasn't. Um, I'm also as I was uh, uh, telling Elenia before, the social historical co context had um, a creative breakage in mobility literature because now hardly anyone would call free movers Europeans, we are after, particularly after Brexit, we all became migrants, citizens of nowhere, as uh, Theresa May <laughs> kindly reminded us. Um, so, so um, yeah, uh, I hope I addressed that. Idea. I don't have the answer about the question of agency structure, and I know that it will take a while <laughs> to debate that. But um, I think accounting for both is quite useful um, most of the times. Um, and similarly, the, the question about mobility and migration, I feel as a scholars, and I'm referring to this interesting paper by Thomas Face, um, which is, speaks about how sometimes in social science we don't realize that how we label things is not just a reflection of what's going on at social media society level, but it's also got an impact. So by naming things in a certain way, we're sort of contributing to things about um, social issue in binary terms. And sometimes this is not hugely useful. And, uh, and that's what I felt sometimes by reading youth study literature on mobility and reading studies about migration, how we name things, uh, can be relevant about how people are speaking about it nonetheless in like sort of everyday life. Thanks a lot, Michaela, especially for this last remark. I very much agree with you. We like to find um, cool labels to be remembered somehow. But that's true. There is a lot of responsibility on our shoulders to, in order to um, to, to respect what these narratives are about in, in the intention of the interviewees in the first place. So I really wanted to thank uh, to thank you on this on this point. 
and thanks a lot uh, Luca um, and thanks a lot Elenia as well for your uh, standpoint on this discussion and I think we can virtually uh, well of course it's thanks to, to, to the ones who uh, made quest made question and attended without making questions I think we can cut ourselves uh, virtually uh, of course everybody hopes that the next next occasion would be uh, uh, not on uh, uh, Zoom at all, but with the opportunity to uh, exchange ideas in person as well. So thanks a lot, Michaela, again. And thank you, and I want to thank you all, and particularly, well, Valentina and, um, and Juliana, but also Luca and Elenia. I think I, uh, you provided with such an intelligence, clever comments. I don't think I was able to answer on the spot. Uh, my best idea always come two days after, so I might follow up by email to some of your questions and your points. Thank you very much for reading the paper. Yeah, that's brilliant. Thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, and have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. <laughs>